<laughs> so welcome to the first uh, London Learning Lean seminar. It's lovely to see so many of you uh, online. And uh, the, the speaker this week is Maria Inesta Frutos Fernandez uh, from Imperial. And uh, she's going to tell us about her work formalizing ADELs and IDELs. Hey, uh, hi, uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Kevin. I'm really happy to be giving this talk and also really excited for the upcoming, uh, upcoming talks in this seminar. So today what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be telling you about uh, my work formalizing uh, the ring of Adels and the group of details of a number field. Um, I'm not going to assume that everyone in the audience know what these objects are or that you are experts in number theory. So I will start by giving some motivation as to why I wanted to formalize this. And then uh, we'll get into uh, the actual formalization. Right. So, um, okay. so in, the, in its most basic form, number theory is just uh, the study of the integer numbers and the rational numbers, right? And we can do this uh, using either algebraic methods or analytic methods. Um, if we go in the analytic, in the analytic method route, uh, one option is just to take the usual uh, absolute value in the rational numbers, uh, compete with respect to this absolute value to, to, to get the, in, in the real numbers, right? And then study the rational, uh, the rationals as a subspace of the real numbers. Uh, however, this is not the only interesting absolute, absolute value that we get in the, in the rational numbers, right? Um, we also get uh, another absolute value, the periodic absolute value associated to its prime number P. And I'll say a bit more about this absolute value later. For now, I will just say that um, for the periodic absolute value, the prime P is small. So if you have a number that is very divisible by P, that number is going to be very small for this absolute value. Uh, same as we did with the Euclidean absolute value, we can complete uh, the rational numbers with respect to the periodic absolute value, and that is going to give us uh, the ring of periodic numbers. So again, this is uh, a ring that contains the rational numbers, and so we can use it to study to study the rationals, to get some information about the rationals. And at this point, we have considered all of the possible absolute values on Q, because we have a Sturzky's theorem that tells us that these are actual equivalents. These are actually all of the non-trivial absolute values in the rationals. So since the starting Q inside of each of the completions is going to give us uh, different kinds of information about the rationals, uh, one natural question is whether we can study all of them at the same time, right? Um, if we want to do that, uh, maybe the first idea that comes to mind is just to consider the product of all of the completions. Right, so taking the product of QP for every prime P and then take the product with the real numbers. Uh, however, that is not exactly how we are going to define the ring of Adels. We are only going to consider some uh, subset of this product, right? So we define it as this, uh, this thing called the restricted product, which is going to be um, is going to be defined by the property that uh, every element xp in the others satisfies that at almost all primes, so for all, component, all components except for a finite number of them, uh, we have that the norm of the element uh, at that component is small, is less than or equal to one. Okay, so why did we do this instead of just uh, working with the full product? Um, well, the reason is that the product, in some sense, is too big, uh, but this already has a lot of the properties that we want. So it already has the property that it is a topological ring, and we'll say more about what, what the topology is uh, in this ring later. It also contains Q as a subring, right? Because if I have a rational number, uh, I can include it into the others just by uh, considering the other that has this rational number in every component. Right. And actually, the ring of others has a property, a topological property that the full product doesn't have. And this property is that it is a locally compact space. 
And that means that uh, studying, uh, doing analysis in in these uh, topological spaces is easier in some, in some ways. Okay. And besides the standard in the ring of a test, it's also useful uh, to consider its group of units. And uh, we are going to call that the group of iterators of Q. And these objects, we have defined them for Q first, but we can actually define them for any global field. That is, uh, we can define them for K being any number field or any function field over a finite field. And one observation that I want to make at this point is that uh, if we have a number field k, the ring of integers of k is going to be added in the domain. And a lot of the things that we are going to do today will work in that level of generality. So that's how we formalize the meaning. OK. And before going to the, the formalization that I did, I want to give some ideas of where these objects show up in number theory. And basically, they are everywhere, right? So I give some examples here going from like uh, the more concrete to like the more general in some way. So maybe one of the first applications that you see of the group of details is that you can use them to give a proof that um, the class group of a global field is finite. Um, another big application of them uh, is Tate's thesis, right? Where uh, Tate, um, he studied uh, an integration theory uh, over the group of ideas that allow him to um, get some facts about L functions associated to number fields. Then we have a uh, class field theory, which is this uh, whole area of number theory that has to do with um, studying um, Galois, Galois abelian extensions of uh, local and global fields. Um, which this is a theory that can be formulated either in, either in terms of ideas or in terms of ideas. And then finally, I mentioned here the Langlands program, which is some uh, huge generalization of classical theory. And it's also a very, very active area of uh, research right now in, in number theory. Um, so, yeah, so as you can see, there are many places where these objects show up. And if we want to see some of these uh, theories formalized in Lean, we have to start providing the pieces that you need to define them, right? So this was my main motivation to uh, formalize in the Lean of a test. Okay. So now that we have seen why we want to do it, I'm going to tell you about the way this talk is going to work today. So I'm going to start by giving some background on the leaking domains and addict valuations, uh, which are the kind of absolute values that we are going to consider in the leaking domains. Then uh, we'll see how to put together all of these absolute values and create the finite other ring of a leaking domain and the other ring of a number field. Uh, once we have set up all of these definitions, I'm going to give two applications. Uh, these applications are going to be of different nature in some sense. So one of them is going to be the statement of a hard theorem. So it's going to be the statement of um, the main theorem of global class field theory. And the other one is going to be a proof of an easier theorem. Right? It's going to be the proof that uh, there is a subjection uh, from the ideal class group to the ideal class group of a number field and also the computation of the kernel of this projection. OK, and I will end up the talk by discussing some future directions associated to this project. And I will leave some time, some time for questions at the end. But I also want to say that if you have questions during the talk, uh, maybe just write them in the chat. Or, or if you are here, just like, let me know. OK. OK, so uh, let's start with the Deakin domains. Uh, so the definition of the Deakin domain is uh, it's a, an integral domain, meaning that there are no zero divisors, that is uh, no Ethereum, so that every ideal in the, in the ring is finally generated. It is integrally closed in its field of fractions, and it has a cruel dimension at most one. Uh, the cruel dimension is a positive integer, right? So it can only be zero or one in this, in this case. 
Uh, if the cruel dimension is zero, then this definition of the Dedekind domain is just uh, equivalent to uh, to be in a field, right? So we are not going to be interested in that case today, just because um, if we were to define the others, we will just kind of recover the field again. So it's not interesting. And then uh, we will instead focus in the case of uh, cruel dimension one. So cruel dimension one means that uh, every non-zero prime ideal in the dedicated domain is a maximal ideal. Uh, an example of a uh, dedicated domain with cruel dimension one is the ring of integers, or more generally, if you if you take any number field k, the ring of integers of k is also going to be a dedicated domain. Okay, so I want to point out here that this definition of the dedicated domain uh, as as well as some other equivalent definitions and some facts about them are formalized in Matrix by work of uh, Bannon, Damen, Narayanan, and Nusio. And I also want to mention that uh, Asni Narayanan, uh, she is a student here, a PhD student in the London School of Geometry and Number Theory. And she will be also, she will also be giving a talk in this seminar series. So, um, you should come to that if you're interested. Okay. So we have the definition of the Dedekind domain. Now we want to see which kind of absolute values we are going to consider, right? So we are going to start by defining uh, additive valuations, so non archimedian additive valuations. And that uh, can be defined well, for a Dedekind domain, or more generally for an integral domain, uh, as a function from this domain uh, to the integers union infinity, having the following properties. So first, we have that the additive valuation is equal to infinity uh, if and only if the element is equal to zero. Uh, we have that the valuation of the product is equal to the sum of the valuations. And the valuation of the sum is at least equal to the minimum of the valuations. So what is one example of this? So the, the first example is going to be the periodic valuation that I mentioned at the beginning. Right. So for this example, I'm going to take my integral domain R to be the ring of integers, and I'm going to fix any prime number P. Then uh, to define the periodic valuation of, a, of an integer number r, what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor r, right? I know that the factorization of r is unique uh, up to reordering, so I'm an up to units, I guess. And I'm going to look at how many times p appears in this factorization, okay? So um, that's going to be the periodic valuation. So it's the maximum, the, the, the maximal exponent n such that p to the n divides r. Once we have this valuation in the integers, we can actually ex extend it to a valuation on the rational numbers. And the way we do this is if we want to um, compute the valuation of a fraction, we just define it to be the valuation of the numerator uh, minus the valuation of the denominator. And in case you have never seen this kind of uh, evaluation before, I include some examples here, right? So, um, for example, we take the prime p to be 3. Then, uh, since 18 is equal to 2 times 9, uh, we get that the, um, the 3 added valuation of 18 is going to be 2. And then, for example, if we look at 5 over 27, then uh, 3 doesn't divide 5, and 3 divides 27 three times. So, the the, the three added valuation is going to be negative three. Okay. Now there is uh, another way to think about this valuation, which is uh, to think out, think about the associated multiplicative valuation or the associated absolute value. So this is how we are going to define. We are going to fix any um, real number that is greater than one. And now we are going to define the absolute value as a function uh, taking values in zero union powers of this uh, of this real number in D, right? And the, val the absolute value of R is going to be NV raised to the negative of the additive valuation. 
Um, so the reason that we have this negative is to get that this is actually an absolute value, right? So it's going to satisfy these two properties. So first, the absolute value of R is equal to zero if and only if R is equal to zero. Next, uh, the absolute value of the product is equal to the product, the product of the absolute values. And then finally, um, well, we have that um, not just that the absolute value of the sum is less than or equal to the sum of the absolute values, we actually get something a bit stronger. We get that the absolute value of the sum is uh, less than or equal to the maximum of the absolute values. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so this is an, a non Archimedean absolute value. Uh, one comment here is that I have made a choice. I have chosen a positive number n uh, and v to define this uh, absolute value. However, this choice is not really important in the sense that if I pick another number greater than one, uh, the two valuations are going to be equivalent. They are going to define the same topology. So uh, I only care about equivalence classes of valuations. So I don't really care about this choice of NP. Okay, now, um, once we have this absolute value on the ring R, or also we could do it on the field of fraction scale, right? We can compete with respect to this absolute value. So for example, uh, if we are considering the periodic valuation or the periodic absolute value uh, in the integers and interrational numbers, we can complete them. And that is going to give us uh, respectively the periodic integers and the periodic numbers. Okay. Um, any questions so far? No? Okay. Okay, so now um, we want to see some examples of this kind of absolute value um, on the Reiki domains, right? So we are going to fix uh, for the rest of the talk R to be a Dedekind domain, remember with cool dimension one. And now we are going to fix a maximal ideal of R. Um, so we want to define some valuation associated to this maximal ideal, and we want to use the same idea that we did to get the periodic valuation, right? It might seem at the beginning that we cannot do exactly the same, right? Because uh, remember to define the periodic valuation, we are taking uh, the factorization of an integer number, and we are using that this factorization is unique. Uh, this is not going to be true in general for the Dedekind domain, so not all the Dedekind domains are going to be unique factorization domains. Uh, however, we get uh, a, the property that every non-zero ideal of a Dedekind domain can be factored uniquely as a product of uh, prime ideals uh, up to reordering. And this is enough to define the valuation, right? Because what we are going to do is if we want to define the emadic valuation of an element R in the Dedekind domain, um, we are going to look at the principal idea generated by this element R, and we are going to count how many times M appears in this factorization. So that's going to give us the emadic valuation of R. Same as before, uh, we can extend this to the fraction field of the Dedekind domain. Uh, just by defining the valuation of a fraction to be the valuation of the numerator minus the valuation of the denominator. Now, uh, this is going to be a non Archimedean valuation on the Dedekind domain. Uh, so, as before, we can consider the corresponding absolute value. And that's actually what we are going to work with in Lean, right? So, we are just because we have a lot more API to work with uh, multiplicative valuations, we are going to work with, with that, with the multiplicative absolute value. Um, so that is what Lean calls valuation. So hopefully that, will, that won't be very confusing for this talk, but from now on, when I say valuation, I mean the multiplicative valuation or the absolute value, okay? Not the additive valuation. Okay. Um, so one last thing that I want to comment before going to the actual to the actual formalization is uh, a slightly different perspective on uh, the valuation in the fraction field. 
Uh, so to do this, I'm going to talk about the notion of fractional ideal. So a fractional ideal in the fraction field uh, K of R is going to be a submodule such that in some way I can clear denominators and get, and get an idea. Right? So it's an R submodule I of K such that I can find some element R in the ring R uh, such that when I multiply R times I, I get an ideal of R. Okay, since we have a unique factorization for ideals of the domain, we can also extend this to get, uh, in some in some way, a unique factorization for fractional ideals, right? But now for this factorization, we have to allow the possibility that some of the primary ideals that appear in the factorization will appear with negative exponents, right? So, um, yeah, so I, I have formalized this factorization in Lean. So the way I do it is uh, I write a fractional ideal I as a thin prod over all maximal ideas and then uh, raised to the corresponding uh, exponents, integer exponents. And I provide some API for working with these, these exponents. Okay. Um, so connecting this back to the evaluation, uh, what we can do is uh, for any element K in the fraction field, we can look at the fractional idea generated by K. And then we can look at the factorization on that and uh, look at the exponent of M in this factorization. So that is going to be the emetic valuation of K. Sorry, can I have a quick question? Sure. Uh, so when, uh, which way do you formalize the very definition of the fractional ideal, the one at the top or just as a factorization? Oh, no, so, sorry, the definition, the formalization of fractional ideal was already in, in, in Matthew. What I uh -huh. formalize is how to factorize it in this way. So I, I formalize think. that if you have a fractional ideal of a dedicated domain, you can write it as a thin plot of uh, overall maximal ideas in the dedicated domain. I see. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, so now, uh, yeah, now I'm going to show you some actual link code uh, to give you an idea of how I formalize all of these notions. Um, so the first thing I do is I formalize the valuation, right? So we have to set up the variables that we are going to use. Uh, here, R is going to be our dedicated domain. Uh, K is going to be the fraction, the fraction field, right? So that that is encoded by these three fields here that uh, say that K is a field, K is an algebra over R, and K is a fraction ring of R. And then uh, I'm going to define the maximal spectrum as um, the set of all, sorry, this, the type of um, of non-zero prime ideals of the dedicated domain. Okay. And just a warning here that this is not really the maximal spectrum if R is a field because that would be the ideal zero. But as I've said at the beginning, I don't care about that case. So I'm just calling this the maximal spectrum. Okay. And yeah, just um, also for the rest of the talk, I will fix V to be um, to be a maximal ideal of R. So I'm kind of using the same notation for um, for the maximal ideal and for the valuation associated to it, some way. Okay, so now let's look at the actual definition of the valuation. That's this in valuation depth. So the input that this takes is an element R of the Dedekind domain. And the output is going to be an element of with zero multiplicative set. Okay, so what is this? So multiplicative set is the way that we are formalizing taking powers of this, um, this number MP greater than one, right? Uh, so basically what multiplicative does is if you feed it some type with some additive structure on it, it will give you the corresponding multiplicative version. But you can just think of it as, um, yeah, just raising some positive number, um, sorry, some number greater than one uh, to integer powers, okay? 
And then with zero, uh, this is just taking uh, zero union base powers. Okay, so um, we define this using an if then else definition, right? So if R is equal to zero, uh, we define the valuation to be zero. And if R is not equal to zero, what we do is we look at um, we look at the factorization of the ideal, um, the principal ideal generated by R, right? And we count how many times the maximal ideal V appears in this factorization. Okay, so that is the additive version of the evaluation, right? And then, then to get the multiplicative version, what we do is we take the negative of the additive evaluation and we raise NP to this negative number, right? So that is done by this uh, multiplicative uh, of that function here. And yeah, I'm using associates that make here, but don't worry too much about that. I just do that because the API was more convenient than just working directly with ideas, right? But you can just think of this as being, um, yeah, like how many times the ideal V appears in the factorization of the idea generated by R. So the factors is some multi-set? Uh, yes, it's a multi-set. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is the valuation in the Derek in domain. The next thing to do is to extend this to the valuation on the fraction field, right? Um, so now the input to the function is going to be an element in the fraction field. Uh, the output is still an element in which zero multiplicative set. And the way we do this is, well, we know that every element in the fraction field can be written as a fraction of elements uh, in the Dedekind domain, right, uh, with non-zero denominator. So that is done by this line, uh, is localization makes subjective. This is telling us that we can find such a numerator and denominator, right? Um, here I'm calling S, uh, to be the denominator of this. And I'm defining the valuation to be um, the valuation of the numerator. Uh, so this is this B dot in valuation def of classical sum of all of this, uh, divided by the valuation of the denominator. Okay, uh, since we are making a choice here, we are making a choice of how to express X as a fraction. We have to make sure that uh, the choice doesn't affect the definition, right? So if I pick two different ways to write um, to write x as a fraction, I still get the same the same result, and that is what this lemma here is checking, right? So it's, it's saying that if uh, r divided by r divided by s is the same as r prime divided by s prime, then um, yeah, the evaluation is going to be the same whether I use R and S or R prime and S prime. And then the last thing I will say about valuations at this point is some examples of things that uh, we might want to prove about valuations and that might be useful later on. Okay, so first, um, if I look at an element in the Dedekind domain, I have two ways of computing the valuation, right? So I, I can compute the valuation as an element in the Dedekind domain, or I can look at the element uh, inside the fraction ring and compute the valuation there. But these two valuations should be the same, right? So this is um, this is what the first uh, lemma is is telling us. And then. Um, yeah, two other facts that I checked are that um, elements of the Dedekind domain have valuation less than or equal to one, and that actually this valuation is strictly less than one uh, if and only if the ideal P appears in the factorization of the ideal generated by the element. Okay. Finally, uh, another important fact is that 
um, there are uniform there exists a uniformizer for this valuation so that means that uh, there exists uh, an element of k also an element of r uh, that has a valuation equal to one sorry additive valuation equal to one which corresponds to multiplicative valuation nv to the power of negative one okay Okay, so if there are any questions, I will move on to how to use this to define uh, the finite other. Oh, you have a question? Yeah. Uh, how easy was it to find the definition of the valuation? Uh, the definition? You mean um, like this definition, like a solution? Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't have much trouble with that. So one thing that I did prove is that um, yeah. So one thing that was helpful was proving directly that if you take this localization, make K R S, that that is equal to you know the valuation of R divided by the valuation of S, and having that. Um, yeah, having that things are not so hard. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So the trick is to use the sum spec as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The sum spec is the APR. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, um, so let's see how to define the finite other ring. Um, so re recall from the beginning of the talk that I have defined the other ring of Q as the restricted product of all QPs and the real numbers. And I actually give some notation here that if I just forget about the real numbers and I look at the restricted product of the QPs, that's going to be the finite, uh, the, the finite other uh, ring of Q. Okay. Um, so that is actually something that we can define for any Dedek in the main, right? So um, what we have to do is we have to replace QP by um, the fraction field localized at some values, right? So we are going to define the finite other ring of R. As the product, the restricted product over all maximal ideals of the Dedekind in domain of K, which is the fraction field, uh, lo localized, sorry, uh, completed at um, completed at the maximal ideal M. So by that I mean uh, you look at the absolute value corresponding to this maximal ideal and then uh, you take the completion. As before, uh, the restricts the restricted product means that we are not taking all of the elements in the product. We are only taking elements of the product that have the property that at almost all components, so all but all but finitely many, um, x m is going to be uh, an integer for the valuation. That is, it's going to be an element that has valuation uh, less than or equal to one. Okay, so what are the properties of of this subject? Uh, so it's it's going to be a topological ring, right? So to get the ring structure, we just work component wise, right? Since after all, this is a subring of the product, right? And then uh, to get the topology, we are going to use um, we are going to do that by saying what a base uh, what the generating set for the topology is. So it's going to be generated by products over maximal ideas of open sets um, with the property that for almost all maximal ideas, the open set that we take is equal to the ring of integers. So it's equal to the elements of Km that have uh, absolute value less than or equal to one. Okay. So um, yeah, so let's see how to do this in Lean. The first thing that we have to do is we have to formalize these completions KM, right? So that's what, it, what I'm going to do here in the next slide. Um, 
there were like several ways to approach this, but I ended up using this one because, um, yeah, like this was um, a part of the library developed by Patrick Massad that was very helpful. Um, so here's how I did it. So first, um, I used this value, this structure here, to put together the information that K is a field with a, with a certain value. Okay? So in this case, um, when I define the value K, um, I'm saying that K is a field with evaluation associated to this uh, maximal ideal V. And I'm also saying that this valuation takes values in which zero multiplicative set. And this group thing here, this is just telling me that, um, yeah, that this with zero multiplicative set is a linear order uh, commutative group with zero, which we know to be true. Okay, so the reason why doing it this way is so, so nice is that um, then we basically automatically get the instance that uh, K is a uniform space. Uh, so we can use uniform space completion, completion to get the completion of K with respect to this, uh, with respect to this valuation. Uh, so that's what I call KV here. Uh, again, uh, MathLeaf already knows that if I complete uh, this way, uh, if I complete a field this way, I'm going to get a field. And again, I put together the information that uh, this is a field with evaluation. And in this case, the evaluation is going to be the extension of uh, the VADIC valuation in the field case. Um, and I didn't include it here, but we also get that uh, this KV with this valuation is um, is a topological field. So addition, multiplication, and inversion are continuous. Okay, and finally, I want to define the ring of integers of this valuation. So that's RV. And yeah, these are just the elements that have valuation less than or equal to one. Okay, so now that we have all of the completions, uh, we can put them together uh, to get uh, the other, the finite other ring. Um, remember, we want to take the restricted product of all of these completions, right? So the way that we are going to do this is first, we are going to look at the full product. So that is this K hat. This is just the product of all uh, maximal ideas of K completed at that maximal idea. And then we define the finite ideal ring of, of R as the subtype of this K hat. Um, okay, such that um, at almost all maximal ideas, we get that the component of, the component XV uh, is in RB, right? So the component is it it has um, none less than or equal to one. Okay, so this um, this symbol here for all f in filter cofinite, this is the syntax for telling him that we want to take the restricted product, right? so that we want to include this condition for all but finitely many places. Uh, yeah, and um, well, this definition is only. Uh, giving us a, a type, right? So we want to check that this is actually a commutative ring. Check that um, it's not too hard, right? Like the only things to check is that, um, well, that it's close under some uh, subtraction and multiplication, right? And once you have that, like all of the other properties are almost immediate. Would you support with any filter? Oh, I don't really know. I only know how it was with the final. Right, it's a big yeah. <laughs> I know it can be used like more generally, but I, I've only used this case of it. Yeah. So if you have for all F in filter cofinite, this tells you for all but finite in it. Yeah. Uh, okay. So yeah, checking that this was a commutative ring wasn't hard. Uh, checking that it is a topological ring was a bit harder, right? So to do that, we have to define uh, 
the topology, and we do that using the generating set, right? So remember, the topology is generated by products of open sets such that um is equal to rm uh, for almost all m. So that's what we are doing here, right? So we are saying that um, the generating set consists of uh, sets of finite others. So this is this u here. Um, having the property that u is essentially equal to a product of, um, yeah, to a product of open, open sets at its maximum ideal, right? Um, yeah, so this is this line that for all x in the finite other ring, uh, x is in u if and only if for all v, uh, the v component of x is in uh, v, v, right? And then we, so this tells me that u is a product. Then the next uh, parenthesis is telling me that all of the components, all of the sets that appear in the product are actually open sets for the corresponding topology. And finally, uh, we again use this for all f in filter cofinite uh, syntax uh, to say that at almost all uh, maximal ideals e, this uh, open set is actually equal to um, the set of integers for the values. Okay, so when we have the generating set uh, for the topology, uh, Lin already knows how to get the corresponding topological space. So that's what we do here. Uh, however, uh, it's not immediate that this is going to be a topological ring, right? So to check that this is a topological ring, we have to check that uh, addition and multiplication are continuous. Um, so I did this just by checking these properties for the elements in the generating set. But the proofs of the proofs of these two facts that continuous and multiplication are uh, sorry addition and multiplication are continuous um, are quite long. So each of them is about a hundred lines, which are probably the longest proofs that I have in the project. So I'm hoping that once this gets PR to Madly, maybe some people will have ideas on how to how to improve them, how to get shorter proofs. Um, Okay, so now I want to give you an example of a proof. Um, wait, do I, do I have, how much time do I have? Can you have as much time as you like. Oh. <laughs> um, okay, so then we did. Okay, so, okay, so I just want to give an example of a proof using this topology, and that, that's going to be this uh, kind of silly fact that if I take the product of uh, RB, at its uh, place V, that's going to be open in a fin, right? This is so basically by definition of the generating set. So let's see how the proof uh, works. So the first line, apply uh, topological space generate open basic. This is telling me that if I have a set that is in the generating set, that is an open set for the topology. So, um, the way that I'm going to prove that this uh, set is open is by proving that it is actually in the generating set. Now, in the next line, I'm just uh, rewriting what the definition of this generating set is. And now, uh, yeah, I just have to tell Lin uh, which product to use, right? But in this case, this is quite obvious, right? Because I'm just going to take the product that has RV at every component. Uh, so this is just the definition of the set, right? Um, so now the first condition is just equality by definition, basically. So it's proved by Ruffel. Then uh, to check the openness, the openness condition, I need to check that the ring of integers RV is open in KV, which is something that I proved, um, which is, it wasn't hard to prove. It's just checking that it is an open ball for the topology. And then the last thing to check is that for all but finitely many Vs, uh, the, the set that appears has to be equal to RV, right? But in this case, this is actually true for all V, right? Not, not for all, but finitely many. So we just have to check that the complement of the sets of the set where this uh, happens uh, is empty. 
And that's what it's done here in the next uh, couple of lines. Okay. That was computer generated that last slide. Uh, probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So now, uh, now that we have the other ring, uh, defining the either group is going to be quite easy. So the either group, the finite either group, by definition, is just the unit group of the finite other ring. And uh, this is a topological group, but the topology is not the subspace topology, it's the topology that it's induced by the map uh, sending an iter x to the element x, comma x inverse in the product of the others with the others. Uh, yeah, so this topology is, al is already implemented in general in matrix. So um, yeah, so to define the iter group, I just literally define it as the units of the finite other ring. And then, uh, yeah, I can use, uh, yeah, I can use the things that are already in matrix, right, to get that um, this is going to be a topological space, a group, and actually a topological group. Okay. Finally, um, I want to define a map from the iters to the fractional ideals of the ring to explain kind of um, how they are connected. So um, the way to do this is um, if I have an iter x, uh, which is x in each component, I'm going to define the, uh, the fractional ideal, uh, which is the product over all m of m to uh, the additive Evaluation of the component Xm. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm going to, I'm not going to say much about the implementation here. I, I will just point out that since we are, we have defined things using the multiplicative evaluation, uh, we do need some way to recover the added evaluation here. Um, but yeah, maybe I don't want to get into the details uh, at this point. Okay, uh, so now let's move on to number fields and the other ring of a number field. Okay, so a number field is just a finite extension of the rational numbers. And they have the property that every element in the ring, in, in, in the field K, is the root of a polynomial with a rational coefficients. Right? Uh, we can Consider the elements that are actually roots of polynomials with integer coefficients instead of rational coefficients. And those elements are called algebraic integers. Uh, they form a ring, a subring of K, and that ring is actually a dedicated domain. So because this is a dedicated domain, uh, all of the work that we have done before applies to it. And we can just define the finite of the ring uh, of the field K, as the finite of the ring of the ring of integers of k. Okay. And then, um, okay, so the thing is that here we have only considered the non Archimedean valuations on k, right? Because this is all we do for the general case of a Dedekind domain. Um, but to get the the other ring, we also want to consider the Archimedean values, right? So we need some way to include them. So the way I formalized this in Lean was just by defining the other ring to be the product of the finite other ring with R tensor K over Q. Um, this is again a topological ring. So the way to get this is where we already have seen that the finite uh, other ring is a topological ring. Then on the right, we have R tensor K, uh, which is going to be isomorphic to R to the N, where N is the dimension of K over Q. So that also has a topological ring structure. And then um, this is the product of two topological rings, so it's also a topological ring. And as before, we define the 
finite ideas and also the ideas just as the units of the finite uh, other being or the units of the other being. Okay. Um, so lastly, uh, remember that we had a way to include the field K inside the other ring, right? Just by sending K to the other that has K in every component. And actually, if we if we restrict ourselves to elements of K that, that are non-zero, right? Uh, that's going to land in the ideal group. So if we send a non-zero K to the element that is K in every component, that's in vertebrates, that's an ideal. Uh, which means that we can look at the quotient of the ideal group by um, the units of K, and that's the ideal class group. Okay, so we also define this in in the end. Uh, this is again a topological group uh, using the quotient topology. Okay, so now. Um, these are like all of the definitions that I wanted to discuss in the talk. Now I'm going to move on to some applications of um, this formalization. So the first application is stating the main theorem of global class field theory. So as I mentioned briefly at the beginning, uh, global class field theory studies uh, Galois, extens Galois extensions of um, global and local fields, right? Um, and also like the corresponding value groups. So here uh, we are going to fix K to be a number field. And we are going to denote by GK, the absolute Galois group of K. So uh, the, the, the Galois group of the extension K bar over K, where K bar is the algebraic closure of K. Now uh, this Galois group is actually a topological group. Uh, the topology is the perfinite topology. And this is not in MATLAB yet, but uh, Sebastian Monet, uh, who is uh, in the London School of Geometry and Number Theory, is working on it, and he will be added soon. So we will still have this definition in MATLAB. Okay, so we have. Uh, so he told me today he proved it was very fine. Oh, he did? He finished? Nice. Okay, yeah, so maybe sooner than expected. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so we have. The definition of the absolute Galois group, not just as a group, but also as a topological group. And um, we are going to look at the abelianization of this group. And by that, I mean the topological abelianization, right? So I'm going to look at the commutator subgroup of GK. Um, and then I'm going to look at the, um, the topological closure of this commutator. So that is going to be a normal subgroup of GK. So I can uh, take the quotient by this normal subgroup and that's going to give me a group. Uh, this group is what I denote uh, JK abelian here. And the topology is, is just going to be the quotient topology. Okay. So what the main theorem of global class theory is going to do is it's going to give us a way to describe this uh, GK abelian group. Um, so um, the actual claim is that if we have a number field K and we look at the quotient of the ideal class group of K by the connected component of the identity, then this is isomorphic to uh, the uh, abelianization of the absolute color group um, as topological groups. Okay, so the next slide contains the, the formalization of this theorem. Um, well, assuming that we already have all of the topologies and stuff. So, um, yeah, we set the variables k to be a number field, and then uh, we first are going to state the claim that this map is a group isomorphism. So here I'm saying that number field dot ck, which is uh, the ideal class group of k, Coercented with the connected component of the identity uh, is isomorphic uh, as a group to the abelianization of GK. Um, yeah, I, 
I only formalized the statement. Uh, I want to make that clear. Like the proof of this fact is like really, really long, and I, I haven't even attempted to do anything with it. And then um, the next theorem tells me that this uh, this map that we have we have just defined this group isomorphism is actually a topological group isomorphism. So the way to say that in Lean is that, okay, look at this map, uh, main theorem of global uh, classic theory dot group isomorphism. This map is continuous, uh, that will be this continuous to fan line. And it, it also has a continuous, a continuous inverse, so continuous in fan. Um, so yeah, so putting these two theorems together, we recover the statement that uh, this is an isomorphism of topological groups. Okay, so this is the first application. Uh, the second application uh, is giving a proof using these definitions, right? So the fact that I want to prove is that there is a subjection uh, from the ideal class group of K to the ideal class group of K. And I also want to compute the kernel of this. So uh, to do this, uh, I first look at the corresponding path uh, at the level of ideas and ideas. So, um, yeah, so the claim is that there's going to be a subjective homomorphism from the ideal group of K to the group of invertible fractional ideas of K. What's K now? Uh, K is a number field. It's still a number field. Yes, K is still a number field. Um, well, actually, some of these, um, if you replace IK with AK, IR fin, I guess, uh, you can also prove this for the decking domains. Oh, and I have proved this by the decking domains. Yeah. yeah. But in this slide, K is number three. Okay, so, yeah, so, right, we get a map from, uh, from the ideal group of K to the group of invertible fractional ideas. And this is the same map that we saw a few slides uh, before uh, using the finite ideal group, right? So this is the map that sends an ideal X uh, to the product of M to the M addict valuation of the component X M. Okay, so I'm First, claiming that this is a subjective uh, group homomorphism. Uh, then I'm also claiming that this is continuous. Uh, so we have already seen what the, what the topology on the, on the ideal group is. And now the topology on the invertible fractional ideas is just going to be the descriptive, the descriptive topology. Okay, so I'm saying that the map is continuous for these topologies. And then, uh, yeah, lastly, I want to compute the kernel of the map. And the kernel of the map is just going to be uh, the ideas that have additive valuation zero or equivalently, equivalently multiplicative devaluation one at all finite places. Okay. Um, yeah, so in this uh, piece of code here, what I'm doing is I am defining this map. Right. Um, so yeah. So for each ideal x, I send it to the fin prod over all maximal ideas of R of um, the ideal B considered as a fractional idea raised to um, raised to the additive uh, VR equation of x V. And then. Um, well, the first thing to check is that this is actually uh, a homomorphism, right? And then you also want to check that this map is subjective, uh, continuous, and that the kernel is what I told you. So that's what I did in these uh, three lemmas, which I'm just like writing here without a proof. And then finally, once we have proven all of this, um, an easy corollary tells us that we also have the corresponding results at the level of um, the ideal class group. Okay. So we get a continuous rejection from uh, the ideal class group of K to the ideal class group of K, and the kernel is just going to be the image of the kernel uh, 
in the previous map. Uh, yeah, so this to prove this corollary, really the only thing to check is that if you start with uh, a principal either, so an either that's the same component at its um, yeah at each of the places, right? So yeah, it's really just an element of k, a non-zero element of k. Uh, then that gets gets mapped to um, a principal fractional idea. Once you have that, then you just have to pass to the quotient on both sides and um, yeah, check that um, continuity holds for the quotient topologies. Okay. Um, so now I just want to end the talk by giving you some ideas of what future work I am considering in this project, either things that I plan to do myself or things that I think uh, people might want to do once this um, is in Mathe, right? So, yeah, the first uh, thing that I mentioned here is to formalize alternative definitions of the other ring and prove that they are equivalent to the definition that I gave you. So this is something that I've actually, I I'm already working on, right? So I have already defined an alternative definition of the other, uh, but I still don't have the fact that there is a topological uh, ring or isomorphism between the two definitions. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, I think that's not too far, I guess. Then, um, yeah, some other ideas that I think are interesting. Uh, first is to keep proving facts about the topology of the other ring or the ideal group, right? So for example, I mentioned at the beginning that AK is locally compact. That's uh, something that we might want to check. Also that K is discrete and co-compact inside the, the other ring. And using uh, similar topological facts, we can actually give a second proof of finiteness of the class group of a number field. Also, I should say that maybe this goal is not that important because we already have one proof of this fact in Mathe. Uh, the next thing to do is, well, I have uh, defined the other ring of a number field, um, but I didn't do the function field case yet, so uh, I probably want to do the function field case as well. Um, yeah, another thing that I think it's interesting is uh, when you have a finite extension of of number fields um, or global fields, I, I guess you can look at uh, the corresponding other rings, and they are related in some way, right? So. Formalizing the ways in which they are related in Lean is something that I think will be interesting. And then, um, yeah, I formalize one statement from Gatsby theory, right? But there are many other things that we could formalize, and eventually I get some proofs. Um, and I should mention that um, another object or another theory that shows in Gatsby uh, theory is a uh, group commodity. And Amelia Livingston, which is uh, a PhD student here in London, um, she's going to give a talk uh, on this, um, on, the, on her formalization of the commodity uh, two weeks from today at this seminar. So yeah, you should definitely come to that. And yeah, I, lastly, I just put some dots there because I don't really know what other people might want to do after this is in math, right? So I guess we'll see. Um, yeah, so that's all for my talk today. Um, thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks.